My friend was buried in an avalanche and the other fellow couldn't get him out. And it just sucked me into a concrete kind of coffin and I basically just struggle. Like fight for survival is the main thing. I've got to get out of here. I'm going to get out of this thing. And uh, You're dealing here with the uh, forces of nature and nature, if it's going to win, is going to win. For God forbid, if you're at the bottom of the slope and the avalanche releases, you don't have a hope. You don't have a chance. Everybody out! Is everyone out? You all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Was there anybody under? I am. Mountains have always fascinated people. They are humbling reminders of our insignificance. Some Aboriginal cultures believe the spirits live here, above the clouds. These are sacred places. Europeans settling North America viewed the mountains as barriers to go around. Going over them was out of the question. These peaks remain wild, untamed places. They're intimidating, challenging, and dangerous, all at the same time. In winter, after the first snow, people still come to the mountains looking for a spiritual experience that one special ride down a mountain's back when everything comes together. The sunshine, the snow, and you, the perfect run. To skiers and snowboarders, mountains are the critical ingredient in an intoxicating mixture of fear, excitement, and adrenaline. Hurtling down a mountain slope on the edge of disaster is exhilarating. Occasionally breaking free and stepping into space, working with gravity, falling with style. Time stands still. Your senses are precisely focused. The perfect run may only last minutes but it will be remembered for a lifetime. For most people, skiing and boarding is about having fun, but it's also about challenging yourself against the mountain, pushing your personal envelope and hoping it doesn't break. It may be overcoming the fear and skiing the steepest run on the mountain for the first time. or just getting down the bunny hill without falling. Once the seduction begins, few people can resist the mountain's snowy adrenaline mixture. But some people get hooked on the rush, and their appetite for thrills takes them to steeper slopes and bigger mountains. Skiing and boarding is no longer just a way of life, it's something to live for. Discarding the conventional, embracing the extreme, giving it all up, spending their life on the edge, becoming adrenaline junkies. Well, you know, skiing has a number of flavors. You've got the mogul flavor in the hill, you've got the groomed run high-speed flavor. I like the outback powder flavor, and uh, in some cases the extremely steep slope flavor and uh, first descent flavor. And uh, you don't get that completely in the uh, ski area. You might hone your skills for it there. Like any addiction, the need for more can become dangerous. The thrills these zealots crave can no longer be found within conventional ski area boundaries. To find this kind of action, you need to get beyond the ropes into the backcountry. More and more people are heading into the backcountry than ever before. Some of them are looking for thrills. Others are just looking to get away from the crowds and find some untracked powder a valuable commodity in the skiing world. 
The areas beyond the boundary ropes are often inviting, but can be very dangerous. The mountains are merciless to the careless, the foolish, or the unlucky. I got caught in a slide in New Zealand, and that was a completely unpredicted uh, isothermic thing. Nice warm day like today, spring, uh, warm weather. Never even entered my mind that the uh, slope I was on was likely to rip, and uh, it ripped right to the ground. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I ended up uh, just standing on a little ribbon of snow beside some rocks on the side of it, and all the snow I'd been skiing on was gone. So it can happen to anybody, and, uh, you know, nobody, nobody's uh, beyond the scope of getting uh, caught up in one of these things. It's rolling with you, Avalanche! A big avalanche can reach speeds of 200 miles per hour. A person caught in a big one may be dead before the slide stops, ripped apart going over rocks or through trees. Most weekend skiers never get much beyond the advanced intermediate level and are content with the challenges found within the ski area. Even there you can get into trouble. You're traveling fast with no protection. Hitting a tree or lift tower at 40 or 50 kilometers an hour is like being hit by a car. And of course, there's the other people on the hill. There's nothing worse than an out of control hot shot screaming down the slope. You need snow sense to be safe on any mountain, backcountry or a bunny hill. It's common sense tempered by experience and knowledge. If you don't use snow sense, you may get along fine for a while, but eventually you'll meet the people who pick up the pieces. To these folks, it's just another day at the office. Their morning commute is in a gondola car, and Gore-Tex and ski boots are their work clothes. They are professional ski patrollers. They're not just here for the free lift tickets. Expert skiing is just one of the skills they bring to work. They specialize in first aid, mountaineering techniques, and avalanche control. Pro patrollers help make a risky sport less risky. Most of these folks were seduced by the mountain long ago. Oh yeah, they're addicted. But they satisfy their passion for powder when they go to work. I got here in the fall of 76, and it was probably one of the worst winters on record here. We actually were closed quite a bit of December and uh, some of January and February as well. And then when the, the snow finally came down, we had huge avalanches, and that was the uh, spring of 1977, I was working on the T-bars and I watched the patrol doing avalanche control and uh, they brought down some of the biggest avalanches I've seen here at Whistler and uh, that pretty much inspired me to be a patroller. Patrollers are the first ones on the slopes in the morning and the last ones down at night. A work run in the morning is part of the daily routine. They call it a work run, but it's one of the perks of the job. They get to ski the mountain at its best. For patrollers, it's pretty basic stuff. Important to skier safety and not a bad way to start the work day.
This back, this back part. I like Olympic Cash has a code one toboggan. Okay. This is Whistler Mountain's main dispatch and what they call a bump room. It's one of four bump rooms on the mountain. There's always a patroller here waiting to respond to an accident. It's also a place to catch up on new procedures and review old ones. And there's the paperwork. Nobody can escape the paperwork. For every accident, there's an accident report. Eight-year-old boy, arm injury, bottom of the green chair with his instructor. Thank you. Uh, patrolling uh, on the mountains like here at Whistler and Blackcomb, etc., it's, uh, it's an unusual aspect of first aid because uh, there's various different elements that we have to deal with here, um, i.e. in the dead of winter, the cold, uh, hypothermia, and if someone is even just a little bit shocky, then hypothermia will enhance the, uh, the uh, condition of the, the patient. You never know what's going to come your way. Like I could, uh, you know, the next uh, two minutes get called out for some sort of nasty accident. And so it, it's kind of nice to be in that, that uh, frame of mind of never knowing exactly what's around the corner. And uh, uh, you got to be on your toes a bit. Our role is, is mainly just uh, removing, uh, stabilizing the person and uh, removing them from the mountain. How are you doing, Anna? Okay. Uh, I, if somebody's in, a, in an awful way and they 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 know it, and you just tell them nice and calmly, it's just it's fine, you know. And these are what this is what's going to be happening to you, and we're gonna we're gonna be taking you off the mountain, and you're gonna be going to a clinic, and the doctors there will be dealing with you. Jan Tyndall has been here since 1980. She's paid to read the many moods of Whistler Mountain. Tyndall is one of the two avalanche forecasters. As the forecasters, we are responsible for keeping a close handle on the snow stability within the ski area boundary and also outside of the ski area boundary, and then coordinating the avalanche control that needs to be done so that no avalanches occur in bounds. So really, before we can open terrain for people to go skiing and boarding, we have to make sure that it's safe and that there is no remaining avalanche hazard after a period of snowfall or after a storm, storm period. These automated stations are great, and they give you pretty quick access to lots of information, but we still have three manual plots that we keep going, and we do readings there twice a day. And for me, I find it's really important. You come up in the morning, I stop in there, and I actually know what the snow is like that has fallen. I feel, feel what it's like. You feel if it's been wind affected or not. And you just, you don't get all that if you're just looking at the computer screen. You can't beat the actual being out there and seeing what's going on. The most important aspects of avalanche forecasting is knowing the snowpack in your area. Not only what's happened in the last 24 hours, but what's been happening since the first snowfalls of November. Forecasters and people heading into the backcountry dig holes to read different layers of snow. So I kick the screen down, I can feel a bit of a stiffer layer from last night when it was warmer. And then I'm hitting a bit of a softer layer, mark that off. 
carrying on down through the snow around here, our snowpack settles pretty quickly, which is something we're glad to have. Cornices are another mountain hazard patrollers watch throughout the season. As the winter progresses, the cornices grow, and as they get bigger, the odds of them suddenly breaking off increase. A square meter of this stuff can weigh up to 500 kilos. They don't want a chunk like that falling on paying customers. It's bad for business. Chan decides it's time to do some cornice control, but it will have to wait until the morning. It's 5.30 a.m. Most skiers are still dreaming of the day to come. The lifts aren't open yet, but Anton Horvath, the other avalanche forecaster on Whistler, is on his way up the mountain. The weather station is the first stop. The forecasters need to know what's happened in the night. Snow accumulation, wind readings, and temperature are all part of the avalanche forecasting puzzle. from Whistler Mountain with their observations. Currently in the Alpine at 1,835 meters, our skies are overcast with variable visibility and it's snowing lightly. Present temperature is minus 8 degrees. Winds are from the south-southwest at 20 gusting to 50. Down at 1,650 meters, the skies are the same. As Anton goes through his morning routine preparing for avalanche control, the mountain is coming to life. The crisp stillness of this incredible morning is about to be shattered by TNT. This is the explosive part of being a patroller. They literally blast the snow off the mountains. The explosive charges, or shots, have to be prepped. They use a high-speed explosive with a two-minute delay fuse. On mornings when they do full control, 21 patrollers will throw 150 one-kilo shots. Sip cage overnight, and well, since one since one o'clock yesterday afternoon, winds were blowing a little bit yesterday afternoon, but they never really got any higher than about uh, 65, 70 gusts to 65, 70 to the southeast. And we're looking at uh, zone B and C control only today, and uh, your shots are all prepped outside, so head out the door whenever you're ready, and uh, that's about it. See ya. Okay. Yes, Joey. Hey, Tony. Before you get into that. Joss, get Joss. Yeah, but. I'll call right now. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to show my favorite. I think it was really Most of the avalanche control in this ski area is done by hand. Whistler is a big mountain with 200 potential slide paths. The patrollers have to get themselves in a position above the avalanche zones. From experience, they know exactly where to place the shots. This morning, they're concentrating on cornices. It's dangerous work. They're right above the icy overhangs as they throw explosives tied to ropes over the edge. If they get too close, they could go over with the snow and ice.
this year I was ski cutting um, a cornice and uh, kept coming back so I kept stepping back and the next piece would come back a little bit more and finally I just didn't step back quite enough and it sucked back about uh, five or six feet and got me, took me over and uh, started a small avalanche underneath it and I was, got carried along for a couple of hundred feet thinking in the back of my mind, well my partner's up there, um, he's got all the training I have, we checked our peeps this morning, they both work. Those are the things that we know that we're in a very controlled situation here. My only worry was that the, the avalanche might carry a little bit further and take me over some rocks. And You can see in this shot how unstable cornices can be. This chunk breaks off just from contact with the rope. We don't hang it out. I mean, if you don't, if you're not comfortable where you are, nobody's telling you, nobody forcing you to the edge. We stay back. You're not going to put yourself out to the hazard. One day though, you know, I was out there and, and I thought I was walking a straight line from one rock to another. Big chunk of cornice dropped out, my tracks disappeared. I was still on top, but you're, it, you're walking a pretty fine line. We were doing avalanche control that morning and it was, uh, we weren't sure, we're never exactly sure what's going to happen that day, each day, but uh, it turned out that day there was some big activity on this route and they had called for some extra shots, I recall, and I was one of the guys that was sent to wrap some extra shots, come up and join them on their route. We traversed across the bed surface of the slide and went back to that low rock right behind and to try and uh, try and throw a shot and release the rest of the slope, the hang fire that was left. So I got there, tried my best sideways throw, got it up as high as I could and tucked myself up as high as I could underneath that rock. I remember pretty clearly I was wearing my, uh, my 215 Super G's at the time uh, because when the shot went off, the slab came out quite a bit bigger than we thought and a lot higher than we thought. Okay. Right up to the rock, in fact, and just the tips and tails of my skis were s standing on the, s on the uh, remainder of the snow and underneath my feet, my boots, there was air. It was sort of suspended between the two points of the slab. It, it ran really big. It's a fun day. Look at this shot again. You can see Ken very nearly gets pulled into the slide. Even with all his experience and knowledge, on that morning, the mountain fooled him. Nothing beats a sunny day up here when there's a bunch of fresh snow even though I've been here for 19 years. Definitely one of the perks of the job. We sometimes get those beautiful runs first thing in the morning.
avalanche rescue beacons or peeps, a probe and shovel, life-saving equipment for patrollers or anyone heading into the backcountry. These are the tools you need to find your partner if they're buried in an avalanche. It's not just good enough to carry the equipment. You have to know how to use it if you're going to save someone's life. Okay, so there's a couple of different techniques uh, for finding a peeps. One is the induction method. Um, the system I like to use is called uh, the grid search. And uh, basically what you're doing is you're using a grid pattern for your search. Your peeps is off now, Andrew? Okay, so I'm gonna try and find the strongest signal. Okay, this is it here, I'm gonna follow this. Signal's getting stronger. So you should be finding someone very strong here. in a search in under five minutes and under three, uh, best for a uh, single burial. Out. And we're trying to find a double burial within five minutes. Um, usually um, you have about seven minutes total time before, uh, before you lose someone if there's uh, no air pocket at all. And people have been found in air pockets uh, uh, in over half an hour. You have up to 20 minutes. I found someone alive in 25. But uh, best chances are for the speediest recovery possible. So practice a lot with this. That's the most important thing about using a peeps is practicing. Fades away here. Fades away here. There it is.